Hi, everyone. I'm so glad that you chose to join us today. I'd like to welcome you tonight to our NYC Youth Gathering hosted by Bethel Baptist Fellowship. I'm super excited to hear from God's Word what our speaker, Morris Gleiser, has been led to share with you teens tonight. And although right about now we would have all been arriving to the church, getting out of the vans, hanging out with our friends from other churches, playing some amazing games, eating tons of pizza, and, and hearing preaching actually in person, I'm excited that Morris Gleiser was able to join us tonight via live stream. A few quick things. First of all, if you could take a second and text this link to a friend or share it somehow, somewhere. And then secondly, after you're done with that, turn on do not disturb mode so you don't get any notifications during the message. I'd really recommend you giving God at least 30 minutes of your attention just now to hear what he wants to tell you through his word. So you can go ahead and get your hard copy of God's word or turn on your app and get to Genesis chapter 39 because that's where we'll find ourselves tonight in the scriptures. So let's begin with prayer and ask God to help us understand his word and speak to us and work in our hearts. Lord, we come before you tonight and we just are so thankful for this collective group of teens across the the New York City area that have chosen to sit in and, and join via live stream virtually to hear your word preached. Pray that you would speak through it, through your word to us and that we would listen. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, again, thanks for joining, and I'll see you after Brother Gleiser is finished, but let's begin by singing a song together. You'll actually find the words right there on your screen. I once was lost in darkest night, yet thought I knew in that promised joy in life had led me to the grave. I had no hope that you would own a rebel to your will. And if you had not loved me first, I would refuse you still. Alleluia. Indifferent to the cost, you looked upon my helpless state and led me to the cross. And I beheld God's love displayed, you suffered in my place. You bore the wrath reserved for me, now all I know is grace. Alleluia, all I have is Christ. Alleluia, Jesus is my life. Hey, teenagers, man, it's great to be with you in a most unusual way here, a virtual youth rally. I have I have preached to teenagers for years in some unique places. I've I've preached on uh, boats, and I've been in a barn. I've stood up on bales of hay. I've, uh, uh, boy, uh, on buses. Uh, everything I'm saying starts with the letter B. Uh, but the thing is, I have preached in a number of unique places, but this is my first time to preach uh, to teenagers at a youth rally and it's online. Well, it may not be the last time, but it certainly is the first time. I'm glad to be here. Glad to be a part of Bethel Baptist Fellowship and uh, this uh, effort that they put forth to put this together for you. I don't know what the leadership is doing in order to uh, uh, have some things for you. It's not like they can say, you know, single line, come over here and get your your uh, your hot fudge Sunday or or uh, your plate of pizza because you can't be there. So it's kind of a unique day, and uh, I don't know what games can be played online. I don't know, 
But I do know this, they've asked me to take the, the word of God and to open it up and to proclaim it to you. And I'm thrilled to do it. Now, I've probably not met any of you before and you're not real sure uh, how this is going to go and I'm not real sure what you're going to do to be a part of this. All I'm going to ask you to do is please do this. Listen to what God wants to say to you tonight. Uh, I, I'm, I'm grateful that a church like Bethel desires to be a blessing, to be a help, and to be uh, a source of biblical guidance to you as a teenager. And I, I don't know what your background is. I don't know what your family is. I don't know what, uh, what you're dealing with right now. But would you do this? If you have a copy of the Bible, would you get it? Would you just get a copy of it right now and, and get it prepared and ready to go and, and, uh, and follow me in, in, in the scriptures as we look at some things here in just a few moments? I know your world has changed dramatically, drastically, as it has for all of us in the last, uh, well, what are we looking at now? Several weeks, about a month, maybe a little more now. Well, it, the fact is God is in charge. Um, you probably didn't find out <laughs> that uh, uh, school was going to be closed and you've got to go home and no more fellowshipping and being interacting with your friends at school. I doubt if any of you said, yes, oh man, this is what I've been waiting for. More time with my brothers and sisters, my siblings, oh, and with my parents. Oh, this is incredible. Maybe we can work on a puzzle together and play some games. I doubt if you thought any of those thoughts. I, I doubt it. Uh, you probably thought, what, how am I going to live? Well, you've, you've lived quite well. Can I just remind you of something? There are no perfect homes. There are no perfect set of parents. And you're not perfect either. Now, there's no perfect situation. So you're not going to make it any better by being a complaining, hard to get along with person in your home. I don't know if you have brothers and sisters, if you are living with a single parent, if you are living with step parents. I don't know if if uh, any number of things may be in your arrangement. There are no perfect homes. And tonight, I want you to look at a teenage guy that came from a home that would be what I would call dysfunctional. It's a troubled home. He's really one of my favorite Bible characters. He might be one of yours. He is uh, a guy that became a Hebrew uh, hero. He was a hero to every Hebrew little boy and girl growing up in Israel's history. Why? Well, because there was an incredible blessing upon his life, and God used him to impact many, many people. His name was Joseph. Joseph. Back in the book of Genesis, we get his story. Get your Bible. Turn to the book of Genesis. Get chapter 39 opened up. We're going to read there in just a few moments. Let me, let me give you the backdrop, okay? Let me give you the, the background of his story. Joseph came from a very difficult home life. It was. It was a troubled home. Look, his dad, his dad had four women in his life. Are you ready for this? All at the same time. And they were all there living together. Okay, do I need to go any further to tell you this home's got problems? Um, I don't would imagine, in fact, the Bible makes it clear, these ladies didn't get along. Uh, they didn't care for one another because they were all fighting for the affection of one man. Well, uh, they began to have the children of this father. and um, But there was one of the four women that the dad loved the most. And for the longest time, she couldn't have a baby. And then finally, she becomes pregnant. And she gives birth to Joseph. Well, I'm telling you, dad began to show favoritism to Joseph in some unusual ways. He began to clothe him with clothes and let him know that he was more special than the other brothers. Now, I'm going to tell you something. The siblings, the brothers in particular, despised Joseph. Why? Well, I mean, Joseph didn't have to work as hard as, as they did. He was the baby of the family. Are you the baby of your family? 
your brothers and sisters have probably told you that you get by with things that <laughs> that they never got by with. I was the baby. I am the baby of our family. It's been a long time ago. But I mean, I my sister would, would say, you get by with murder. You can do anything. And every older brother and sister says that. And I, the only thing I know to do is just kind of look at them and say, get over it. And you move on. But the truth is, Joseph was the pet of his dad. He was daddy's little favorite boy and child. Well, long story short, the brothers despised Joseph. They despised him greatly. They wanted to kill him. Now, I'm going to tell you, I don't mean they just wanted to beat him up. They wanted to kill him. You talk about a troubled home. It was a mess. And one day they took Joseph, stuck him down into a pit in the desert ground, and tried to discover a way to get rid of him, dispose of him, kill him. When off in the distance, they saw, they saw some, uh, e some uh, uh, Midianites or Ishmaelites traveling down toward the land of Egypt. They were on a southern highway headed down toward Egypt. And one of those brothers said, hey, let's just sell Joseph to these gypsies that are heading down toward Egypt and we'll make some cash off the deal and get rid of Joseph. He'll never make the journey. Joseph was 17 years old at the time. How would you like for that to happen to you? All of a sudden, you were pulled away from your family, hated by your brothers, and then sold off to a land that you didn't understand any of their language. You didn't eat, you didn't normally eat the kind of food that they ate. And then when you get down there, you're going to be made a slave, and that's exactly what happened to Joseph. You got Genesis 39 open? Would you follow me? Let's, look, let's start in verse 1. I want you to notice what happens to him, all right? Look at it. It says in verse 1 of chapter 39. Look at it now. It says, And Joseph was brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of, of Pharaoh. Pharaoh would be like the king, the ruler uh, of the land of Egypt. And this man by the name of Potiphar was his... Uh, was sort of a um, FBI. Uh, more, more importantly, he was kind of a uh, he was a a guy who overseer of all enemies of Egypt. He was a he was in the high ranking of the cabinet, if you please, of Egypt. And it says here that Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him. Who did he buy? He bought Joseph. He bought him of the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him down thither. Look at verse 2. And the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man. And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. I'm going to stop right there. We're going to look back at it, so don't close your Bible. You know, Teenagers, uh, you, you've been lied to uh, for years. Well, all of your life, you're you're lied to by uh, uh, by marketers and people who are trying to make money off of you, and they're constantly telling you that the the things that you own are not good enough. The clothes that you wear, if they don't have a certain logo on the on the clothing, then you're really not cool. If you're uh, uh, if your sunglasses uh, don't have a little O right there in the corner, which means they are Oakleys, you know? Or maybe you've got one like I've got with a W. It stands for Walmart. You know, uh, they, they tell you that, boy, you've got to have a, you've got to have a certain kind of, uh, of, uh, uh, clothing, a car, uh, a cologne. You've got to have a certain, uh, a swagger to you. And then if you do have all those things, man, you'll be cool. You are a prosperous, you are a successful person. You see, the world tells you that success is made up of uh, the clothes you wear, the crowd you, you run with, or uh, uh, the uh, the shoes you, you wear. You know, it's like some guy comes home and he says, mom, mom, I got to have 
I got to have a, a new pair of Nikes or, or Under Armour shoes or whatever brand you like. And you say, I just got to have it. I got to have them. And you, your mom or your dad looks at the price and it says, you know, they're 185 bucks. And they look at you and they go, oh, oh, oh no way, Jose. There's no way we're going to buy those shoes. Not on your life. Uh, then, uh, you know, uh, we'll, we'll go find something at the local uh, yard sales. And uh, but there's there's nothing uh, that we can buy like that that's going to cost like that. You know, it you think that it's going to make you a better ball player if you wear some shoe that costs a hundred and some odd dollars. OK, I don't care. There's nothing there's nothing sinful about wearing some nice shoes that have a nice little swoop on it uh, or the three uh uh, stripes of an Adidas or whatever brand you like. There's nothing sinful or wicked about any of that, but it's not going to make you a more successful runner, ball player. You're not going to shoot better. You're not going to dribble better. You're not going to run faster. Um, you just may sit on the sideline and watch everybody else play, but you're going to look good because you're going to have some new shoes on, you know. Okay, fine. It doesn't make you a success. I saw a commercial Many years ago, about some guy wearing a particular cologne. Okay, here's an advertisement for a cologne. You're supposed to smell it, but it's a TV commercial. You can't smell it. But, you know, and he's riding this horse and he's riding in slow motion. You know, anything in slow motion is so cool, isn't it? And it's so manly. And he's so, he's riding on this horse along the beach. And all of a sudden, he looks up among some trees. And a woman comes out from behind a tree and she's got uh, long blonde hair and uh, she's got the look of maybe the intelligence of an IQ of maybe, I don't know, seven. And the next thing you know, she's riding on the horse with that man and they're riding off into the sunset together. And this is a cologne commercial. You're supposed to say... <laughs> I got to get that cologne, man. I mean, look what happens to me. I mean, I'm I'll I'll be strong. I get I get a horse. Everything I do is cool. I get some woman to ride on that horse with me. I'm telling you, I got to go buy that cologne. No. Now, look. I've been around a few teenage guys. I'd recommend that that you go buy some cologne. But that's uh <laughs> that's neither here nor there. My point to you is that it doesn't make you a success. Would you look back at Genesis 39? Genesis 39 tells us that Joseph gets sold into slave. Doesn't sound real successful to me, does it to you? What kind of clothing did he wear? Uh, slave clothes. How much money did he have? Can you spell zero? He didn't make any money. He was given food. He was told what time to get up. He was told what to do when he was up. He, he lived his life uh, day to day being ordered around. He was, he was a slave. Look at verse two. It says there in verse two, and the Lord was with Joseph and he was a prosperous man. All right, time out. What do you mean he was prosperous? Come on, Bible. What do you mean he was prosperous? He didn't have any money. You see, Prosperity is not made up of how much money you have. It's not made up of how many what your clothes look like. It doesn't even come about as a result of what kind of family you come from. Joseph was a prosperous young man. Well, what does that mean? Well, he had a blessing upon him. Verse 3 says, and his master, that's the guy who owned him. His master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. He goes on to say, that the master literally gave Joseph the control of the entire household. He said, Joseph, I want you to be in complete control. I want you to be in complete charge. You, you're you're going to run everything. You're going to pay the bills. You're going you're to do it all. Joseph had a continual rise of blessing upon his life. Now, do you want that? Do you want to get away from pursuing the, uh, the shallow... Uh, here for a moment, gone for a lifetime, success that the world tells you that you can have. Would you, like to, would you like to get away from the applause of the world that you think you've got to have to be a success? Would you not like to have a blessing that comes from God? The kind of blessing that is genuine. I mean, folks, it's the real deal. It's legitimate. 
It's not phony. It's the kind of blessing that others will notice. Did you see that? His master saw that there was something about Joseph that was different from everybody else in the household. Well, what was it? What was it in Joseph's life that, that brought this prosperity and success? What was it? Did you not see what we read twice? Look at it for the third time. Look at verse two. And the Lord was with Joseph. Notice the word with. If you make a point of, of underlining things in your Bible, you might want to underline that phrase. And the Lord was with Joseph. You might want to circle the word with. Verse three says that his master saw that the Lord was with Joseph. What does that mean? He was with him. Well, it's very easy to understand, young people. It means that there was a, a linkage. There was a binding. There was a togetherness of Joseph with God. God was with Joseph. It's like the clothing that you wear. You know, you, you got threads on your clothes. Well, some machine took a bunch of individual threads and wove them together and produced the, the shirt or pair of pants or whatever it is, the socks that you're wearing. The deal is this. There was a tying together of God in Joseph's life. That's a withness. To be with the Lord means to be with him in a relationship, first of all. It means to be with him, to know that, that you have surrendered your life to him and you've said, I am not going to get to you. I'm not going to come to heaven on my own. I need you in my life. Has there ever been a time in your life, teenagers, when you've recognized you were separated from God? And what separated you from God is the same thing that separates everybody from God. It's their sin. You were born with a sin nature, and it's done nothing but got, gotten worse, has it not? I mean, we sin naturally. We think things we shouldn't think. We say things in anger and rage and in vileness that we ought not say. We think on things. We, we say things. We, we participate in things. We go to places that are displeasing to God. We have broken the guidelines and the law of God. God is a holy God, and God can't overlook my sin or your sin. We are separated from God. Joseph, somewhere in his life, recognized that, and he recognized that God has a plan to bridge the gap between him and mankind. And that bridge is what we call the Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus bridged the gap between God and man. You see, when Jesus took my sin and your sin upon himself, when he became a sacrifice for us on the cross of Calvary, he was paying what you and I could not pay to God. God is a holy God. Listen, this is incredible truth. If you've never known this before, if you've never known this before, if you just think that Jesus and church is nothing but a bunch of religion, it's not the case at all. Jesus is the Savior, the rescuer. He wants to rescue your never dying soul. You see, you've got a body that you can see, but you've got a soul that's going to exist somewhere forever. And it's either heaven or hell. And I am asking you, teenager, if you don't know the Lord tonight personally, come by way of Jesus Christ into a withness, a dwelling together with God in a relationship. Joseph, was with the Lord, not only in a relationship, but for some of you who've already accepted Christ, let me tell you this, there needs to be a witness in fellowship. You see, you can be on your way to heaven. You can be on your way to heaven and know that Christ is your savior. And yet at the same time, you're at the point in your life in which there is, there is, there is no interaction of daily fellowship with the Lord. Do you know what this means? It's the idea of taking the word of God on a regular basis and letting God talk to you. 
It's the idea of, of spending time with him in prayer. It's a daily choice. Look, look, this, this relationship that we talked about, that was your personal decision. Nobody can make that for you. And nobody can make that decision once you come to God and have a relationship with him. No one can force you to have daily fellowship with him. That's a personal choice. Not only is it a, a, a personal choice, it's also something that needs to be diligently obeyed. Time with the Lord. Teenagers, you've got some time now like maybe you didn't have before. It would be a great time for you to establish the habit and the routine of spending time with God in prayer. Hey, take a walk. Go outside your house and if your parents allow you to do so and walk uh, privately somewhere and uh, keep that social distance going, but not with the Lord. Don't keep that distance. Get closer to him. Jesus said this, if you will abide with me and allow me to abide with you, he said, your life will be more fruitful. You say fruitful? Yeah. Here, here's the better way of saying it, or, or I should say another way of saying it. Your life will have a blessing, a success you will have a prosperity like Joseph had in his own personal life. If Joseph could have been interviewed, you could have said, hey, Joseph, what, what is the secret of this presence of, of blessing and, and good things that are happening to you? How, how, how does that happen continually for you? And he would have said, my life is filled with adversity. My life is filled with trouble. However, in the midst of hardships, I have the blessing of God upon me. Don't ever get the idea that you spending time with God, you're never going to have trouble. You're still going to have some hardships. You're going to have adversity. It's not the absence of adversity, but it's the presence of God that will make peace and contentment in your life. Hey, young people, can I just plead with you? Spend time with God in his word regularly. Get in the Bible Read some in the Psalms. Read some in the in the in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, read the entire Bible. Make a promise to God. You're gonna you're gonna just read His Word and get to know Him. I'm just telling you, you'll not be disappointed. When I was a teenager, you say you 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 were a teenager. Yeah, long long time ago, there were dinosaurs on the earth. And uh, me and Benjamin Franklin hung out together. No, not true. Uh, we, uh, when I was a teenager, I heard uh, I heard guys like me stand up and say, "Teenagers, the Bible says, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord." And in his law, doth he meditate day and night. He spends time with God. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bring forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither. And whatsoever he doeth shall, let's see, what was that word? Whatsoever he does shall, oh, the, here it is, prosper. Hey, Joseph, what's the secret of your your life, he would say, I have found the blessed prosperity of God, not marked by money and clothes, but by a divine presence in my life because my life was wrapped up in God. Let me turn the corner and quickly finish. You still got Genesis 39. I got to show you another thing that's very important because you don't get much help in this arena these days, teenagers. Joseph had the blessing of God because he was with the Lord. But would you notice something? Go back to Genesis 39. Look at verse 6, please, quickly. It says, and he left all, that is Potiphar, the owner, the master. He left everything that he had in Joseph's hand. And he knew not anything that he had except the bread which he did eat. And Joseph was a goodly person and well-favored. What does it mean he was goodly and well-favored? Well, it meant that he was a good-looking kid. He was a good-looking guy, and he was put together well. He was built. He was, uh, 
He was strong. You say, why would the Bible say that? Because of what happens in the very next verse. It says in verse seven, and it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph and she said, lie with me. But don't miss verse eight. But he refused. And he said unto his master's wife, Behold, my master wotteth, or he knows not what is with me in the house, and he hath committed all that he hath to my hand. There is none greater in this house than I. Neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee, because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Look, Joseph had a blessed life, a blessed, a prosperous, a successful, good life because he was with the Lord and finally because he withstood temptation. Now, temptation comes in all kinds of formats and forms and manners and, and all kinds of ways, but I'm going to laser focus on what the scriptures give us here. Joseph said no in the land of Egypt. Teenagers, do not miss this. He said no to the temptation of immoral practices. Can I tell you that the land of Egypt was comprised of people in which immorality was the commonplace activity? Are you ready for this? Everybody. You may see a few books that are right around me here. I'm in my office at home. I got books that you can't even see on the screen right now. I got a book here in my library that tells us about the culture that Joseph was in. And in that book, it tells us that Joseph was growing up or he was there in Egypt in which it was common for everybody to be in the realm of the immoral. It was expected. It was the common norm of everybody to be wicked in their thoughts and in their practices. And uh, women were highly aggressive in this immorality. You, you saw that in the scripture we just read, the, the boss's wife went after Joseph. He was a good looking, strong, put together kid. And she went after him for immoral purposes. And they even said in that culture, when they dug through the sands of Egypt, they discovered that uh, homosexual behavior was commonplace. Does any of that sound familiar to you? It does to me. You see, friends, we live in a modern day Egyptian type culture that Joseph found him. Joseph was in a wicked, immoral culture, but that culture was not living in him. You have a choice. Am I going to allow the culture to wrap its arms around me and consume my thoughts and my, my actions and my lifestyle, or am I going to determine to say no? Can I show you something? Joseph, let me just remind you, Joseph didn't have his family around. He didn't have a spiritual guide around him. Most of you do. Joseph didn't have anybody that he could turn to and say, hey man, you need to pray for me. I'm, I'm under a lot of pressure. I mean, the boss's wife is coming after me. Look, he made a commitment of moral purity in a land in which moral purity was not to be found. Why? Well, he tells us why. No, the, the lady was con relentlessly coming after him, but he was relentlessly saying, no, I'll not, I'll not go there. You, you're relentlessly under attack. Movies, online websites, um, television, your thoughts, people that friends that have been around you, the language that's gone on, it's relentless. It's everywhere you go. So what do you do? You just say, well, I can't help it, man. I just, you know, it's, it's kind of hard. Yeah. Go talk to Joseph about that. You say, well, I don't have anybody to talk to about it. Neither did he. One of the most important words you'll ever learn is the word no. I'm just not going there. Now, wait a minute. Don't be confused. I'm not saying that as a child of God, you on your own can become super Christian 
I didn't say no to temptation. I'm not an idiot here. But there is a power. There is a strength. There is, there is a grace strength that God gives his people to say no. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted above that which you are able but will always provide a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Truth is, you, you probably have some Christian friends you can ask for prayer from and also grow spiritually with. You probably have a spiritual leader that you can go to and say, hey, I need help. I'm so weak in my in my mind. I'm so weak in my thoughts. I'm so weak in the, the decisions I've made. I want to be right with God. I want to be pure. Look, when you walk, girls, when you walk down an aisle one day to get married, that ought to be a day of great joy, a day of incredible delight. I know you've been thinking about it, haven't you? Sure. Since you were about about six months old, every girl's thinking about she's going to get married someday. It's a, you know, it's like, I, I can't wait. I'm going to get married. You know, you go to weddings to get ideas, don't you? You know, well, I just tell you this guys go to weddings too, not to get ideas, but, but because they serve food. Anyway, uh, the point is uh, you, you, when you walk down the aisle someday to get married, it ought to be a day in which you can look at that that guy standing there to get married to, and you can say, I saved myself for you. And young man, when you walk out and you're looking at that girl, you ought to be able to look at her and say, I saved myself for you. You say, Mr. Morris, how am I going to be able to say that someday? I can't say that right now. I've participated in things. I've looked at things. I've, I've had thoughts. I've, I can't say I saved myself for you. All right. Okay. There is, first of all, a power that God can give you to say no to temptation if you will surrender to him and say, please help me. I'm weak on my own. I need your help. And he'll be there. He'll provide ways of escape if that's what you want. And you're going, to know, you're going to know something. You're going to get stronger. The more you say no, the more you'll find yourself getting stronger against the flesh. But there's something else. There's the point of being able to say, I'm going to save myself from this day forward. I have failed the Lord in my past, but from this day forward, I'm going forward to serve him and being faithful to him being pure for him and being pure for my future husband or wife. Teenagers, Joseph had the blessing of God upon his life because he withstood temptation. Don't, don't get caught up in the idea that your, worth, your own personal worth and value is based upon whether or not you have a boyfriend or a girlfriend. Don't go that way. Your worth is of such value that Jesus gave himself for you. God gave his own precious son for you. Don't think that you're only of value because somebody writes you a note and says, I love you. Now, love is good. That's fine. But you are greater value than that. Don't go down that highway. Don't think that, oh, I just can't wait till I get married. We'll just, we're going to have a wonderful time together and we'll just sit and look at each other every day. And oh, we'll, we'll have little candles on the table and have a candlelight dinner. <laughs> no, you won't. You'll be ordering Grubhub from Taco Bell most of the time. The point is, you, you, you need to live for God. Live for God. Commit yourself to a God in heaven who promises he'll give you the strength to live every day for him and say no to temptation. I had a, I had a young adult lady come up to me. She was not married yet. She was actually in college. She came up to me and she said, I, uh, I was preaching at a, at a Christian camp. And she said, 
I never told you this, but she said years ago when I was in um, high school, I heard you preach and you challenged us to keep ourselves pure for our future husband or for the guys, for, for their future wife. And she said, I didn't tell you, but I promised God that I would do that. She held up her hand. She showed me the diamond on her hand. And she said, next year I'm getting married. She told me the guy she was going to marry, and that fella is a young man that was also surrendered to the Lord, and the guy who wanted to be a servant of the Lord, and he has been serving the Lord for all these numbers of years. She just looked at me and she said, I just want to say thank you for challenging me and others to keep ourselves pure. I said, are you glad you kept that promise to God? Oh, she said, I can't tell you how thrilled I am. And now the two of them together are faithfully honoring the Lord, raising their own kids for the glory of God. Young people, Joseph's life is a living Bible example of somebody who had the prosperity, not as the world defines it, but as God describes it in his word. Joseph came from a troubled home. Your home may be far from what it ought to be. Joseph uh, had some adversity and troubles in his life. Well, I'm sure you've had them and will continue to do so. But in the midst of all that, he had a blessing from above because he was with the Lord in a relationship with him. Have you, have you accepted Christ? He was with the Lord in daily fellowship. Spending time with God is vitally important and he withstood the onslaught of temptation. Teenagers, be a modern day Joseph. Right there where you are, in your room, in your house, wherever it is you're listening to this message, would you bow your heads right now? Just bow your head right now. If you've never trusted in Jesus Christ, you've never done so. You've never accepted Christ as your personal savior. He wants to be your Savior. He's working on you right now. Why don't you pray something like this right now? Dear Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I know it. Please come into my life. Forgive me of my sin. Rescue my soul. Let me know that I'm on my way to heaven because your promise in your word that you would rescue me. Become my savior today. Did you pray that prayer and mean it? Then let, let your church leaders know it. Make a phone call when we get off the phone. Let, let a spiritual leader that is in your life, let them know, call Bethel Baptist and let them know you made that decision. Teenagers, let's keep our heads bowed. If you're already a follower of Christ, but you need to freshly commit to the Lord, to be one who spends time with him regularly and maybe need to ask for forgiveness in this arena of temptation and sin, would you take a moment with your God right now and say, dear God, I want to get to know you. Tell him, tell him, God, I want to get to know you as never before. Tell him, put in your own words and then say, God, strengthen me to say no to temptation. I'll close in prayer while I'm praying. You talk to your God. Father, help these young people as they right now in the next few moments spend some time with you in prayer and make a promise to you that they will get to know you. God, reveal yourself to them. I know you will. You've done it for me all through the years. And God, help each one to fight against the arena of temptation. May they withstand it by your power. May they come to know your blessed power. Thank you for the time we've been able to spend in your word. Raise up many Josephs for this day and age. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, young people. It's been great to spend some moments with you. May the Lord guide you in the days to come. That's an amazing challenge. Thank you, Mr. Gleiser. Teens, the best person to commit ourselves to is certainly Christ. The Apostle Paul said, for me to live is Christ. We should daily live not for our parents 
or our teachers or a boyfriend or a girlfriend, but for God. Joseph came from a troubled home. He had adverse circumstances, like Brother Gleiser said. But in the midst of that, he had a relationship with God and had daily fellowship with him. So that's our challenge. Be a modern day Joseph. <laughs>